I'm Harry, Harry Potter. The book caught me immediately. I mean, Jo Rowling writes with such a, uh, imagination, you know, she has such a vivid imagination and, and uh, such a wonderful sense of humor. And, and you know, it's a, one, it's a mythic book. And uh, Harry himself is, in so many ways, and, and every person and every man, he comes from a dysfunctional family where his parents are dead. He's not a great student. Um, I think many of us can relate to that. Um, and yet he's capable of great things. You must be the youngest Quidditch player in a century, according to McGonagall. I remember hearing a story when I was being interviewed for the, for the directing job of the first Harry Potter film. People were talking about combining two of the books together, or three of the books, just to, just to pick out, because it would be easy as a director, I have to admit, pick out your favorite action sequences, you put them in one film, and you've got a great Harry Potter movie, but then you've destroyed the whole series. When I first met Jo, uh, I made a promise to her that we would be faithful to the book. Uh, and that was of paramount importance to myself and uh, Steve Clovis when he was hired and Chris Columbus when he was hired. This has probably been the most challenging thing I've done um, to, because to condense the book is extremely difficult. And then there's a certain, a certain amount of... Uh, care you have to take in terms of selecting those moments you, you want to be in the movie so that they'll represent the entire book. There's been some criticism from certain people that we've been too faithful to the book. My feeling is if you're a fan of the book, you need to be faithful. If you love something, you should be faithful to it. I can't think of anything I've written where they said that's impossible. Um, I think what everyone has done is, is taken on the challenge of being faithful to the book. Joe Rowling's probably been my greatest asset. Uh, during the two years I've been working on this because she's been, um, you know, incredibly available, very generous with her time. She has such a depth of knowledge, a knowledge that goes far beyond what's in the books. In a way, I look at the book as, as a tree, and we see the tree, but she has knowledge of all the roots. You know, she has endless notebooks filled with, with ideas and thoughts and, and notes on Hogwarts and, and the world and the characters. One of the mantras in the film for us when we were making it was we want this to be unlike anything we've ever seen. We want to do things that are unlike anything that really you have no other filmic reference for. Joe Rowling creates these words. You don't have any filmic reference for a, a ceiling that reflects the night sky. It's not real, the ceiling. It's just bewitched. We didn't have anything to look at. You don't have a filmic reference for a Quidditch game. You know, I don't envy Chris in the sense that, you know, when you have a scene like Quidditch that lives in the minds of readers, uh, and they have it worked out in their head in this extraordinary fashion. To realize that for film is, um, you know, I think terrifying on some level because you want to deliver in every way possible. Um, but I think that's part of the fun of it. Uh, Joe Rowling conjures up these images so vividly um, that uh, bringing them to life just felt like a very natural, as I said, organic process. Hogwarts was a place that should look as if it's been built by magic, constructed by magic, and we felt that that was important in terms of the construction of the set and in terms of the construction of the model, of the, of the look of all of Hogwarts. Yet at the same time, it had to feel timeless. It had to feel as if it's existed forever. It had to be sort of a little grungy, a little dirty, but it still had to have some integrity and reality. I mean, you, you do walk into these sets, wherever you may be here at Leavesden Studios, and you feel like you're at the school, which is a remarkable achievement from our production designer because Stuart Craig designed all of this, and we were all, you know, sort of unified in, the, in a similar vision. We all wanted it to feel very real. Hogwarts is a thousand years old, um, so that process and that knowledge leads you to finding and realizing that the only architecture that exists from them is the great cathedrals. And so that was the, the starting point, that was the trigger, that was the key that unlocked the whole thing. What we were aware of is building a world, a world that was real, a world that would last, or that would seem that would have been there forever, and that would last forever. The chief material used in the set construction on this film is plaster. Does anybody feel like we shouldn't be here? They make moles, um, impressions of real things, and then out of those moles are cast solid sheets of brickwork, uh, sculptures, you know, oak beams, whatever you need. The floor in the Great Hall is made of actual York stone, which has a greater uh, degree of permanence than uh, other materials we might have used, which is a good thing, given that we have 400 kids in and out of there each day. The Great Hall was the, was the dining hall at Christ Church College in Oxford. We took the idea and the physical dimensions of that hall at Christ Church, um, and I think we improved on it, at, le at least as far as the specifics of this movie are concerned.
Hogwarts is a place that's rooted in reality in terms of architecture, but certain parts of that architecture, like paintings on the wall, may move. That's the thing that's wonderful about this place, is it's, it feels real, but if you turn a corner, you may see a ghost, you may see something that's a little magical, it's a little unreal, which is kind of interesting. What's pleasing about what we've done and what we're continuing to do is the number of children, especially, who said, oh, it's just like I imagined it would be. Set and action! This is no graveyard. It's chessboard. The chessboard was built as a complete set, so walking onto that set for the first time was absolutely staggering. I'll never forget working on that set. I, I was so excited about doing the chess scene that I used, to, I used to go to the construction site every couple of weeks just to see how it was progressing. When I got there on the day when the pieces actually arrived and the, and the set actually started to take shape, I was just amazed by the scope of it. And I thought, when we, when we light this properly and we shoot it with specific lenses and we put these little kids in this world, it's gonna feel completely magical. I think this is gonna be exactly like Wizard Chess. The visual effects for me was a, a great challenge because I'd never worked with visual effects before. I always shied away from visual effects because I just felt that I'd get bored with them or I wouldn't be interested in them. Now that visual effects have reached a point that I've become obsessed with them. Out of action, come up immediately. Because if you get an idea that morning where you say, I'd love a ghost to pass through the table here, it doesn't take weeks of planning. You can actually do it. Ah! Hello! I think there are somewhere between seven and 800 visual effects shots uh, in the film. So that undoubtedly was a great challenge, bringing Quidditch to life, bringing the troll, um, Fluffy, uh, Voldemort all to life. You know, the, the, a great challenge. Um, but somehow it didn't feel uh, or it didn't feel impossible. It, as I said, evolved oh so naturally from the book. For Quidditch, particularly, we always felt it was important that Quidditch feels like a, a, a real sport, uh, meaning that if you did have broomsticks that flew and if you had access to a stadium with three enormously huge golden hoops, if you could believe that all those things were possible, if we could make the audience believe that, then we, we could create a sport that, that people believed actually was being played. Oh, male's head. 80% of the owls that you see on screen are real. Gary Giroux, our animal trainer, was in England. He, was a, he had access to more owls, I think, than you could ever find in America. So we were able to train all sorts of owls. The owls are beautiful creatures, but they are difficult to train. When you see Hedwig deliver the, the Harry's Nimbus 2000, his broomstick, we see some of the owls delivering mail. Now, obviously, we didn't fill this room with owls, but we did do several shots with real owls delivering mail here, which is incredibly difficult, but we added some CG owls to fill the room because you couldn't, in terms of training these owls, you couldn't get more than a few in at a time or else they would, they would start running into each other. It's true, then, what they're saying on the train. Harry Potter has come to Hogwarts. We've been looking for Harry for quite some time. Uh, I'd begun looking for Harry before Chris Columbus came aboard in November of 1999. And uh, here we were in July and we hadn't found our Harry. And Steve Clovis and I went off to the theatre. And I walked into the theatre and there was this boy. And I was struck by him and all through the play, I could barely pay attention. I was looking behind me at this person who had this quality, this old soul. I realized that this boy had something very special, had the quality that we were looking for. Ow! You stood on my foot! Obviously, we tested a lot of kids, and once we saw these three kids on screen together, in their initial screen test, we realized that there was an enormous amount of chemistry between them, and we thought, these are the kids, and they fit together. What if I make a fool of myself? You won't make a fool of yourself. It's in your blood. We had the most you know, fantastic group of actors uh, children and adults alike. Once those kids got together and once they formed that bond, the chemistry only intensified. And it was the three of them and then all of the other kids who were together on the set every day, they just immediately became their characters and hit it off. At Hogwarts, we have our very own school. We educate each and every child that, uh, that works on the film, from the doubles to the stand-ins, the extras, and uh, Dan, 
Rupert and Emma, the three principal kids. Come on, guys. This one will be the last day. No matter what happens. Focus. One of the challenges we had to face was uh, making this film on a schedule when you only had your lead actors on set for four to four and a half hours a day. Uh, the children were allowed on site at the studio for nine and a half hours a day. Of that, three hours were given over to education, which was often one-on-one -on -one tutorials. Um, an hour for lunch, 15 minute breaks every hour. And uh, that meant that we essentially had the kids for four and a half hours, four, four and a half hours a day, which is, uh, is tough. Um, but we had brilliant kids and uh, they did really well. They, were, they had a great time doing it. They seemed to laugh an awful lot. One of the challenges we faced was, was uh, trying to stop them smiling in the middle of takes. They had such a good time. I like working with kids because they're very enthusiastic about being here. You take these three kids in the film and the three of them together have uh, such a, an enthusiasm about being on the set, about being involved in the world, that they're willing to give 150%. You can't let them down. I can't be sitting in the background on my chair just yelling action and cutting and not involving myself. I, I like to become an active participant in what's going on. Set and action. I think it all stemmed from Chris, really, Chris Columbus, who um, has four children of his own and uh, creates the most wonderful atmosphere on set. He really feels like one big, family. The, the key for me is to, is to bring out the enthusiasm I have um, for, for these characters and these books myself, to bring that particular enthusiasm out in, in the actors. Hello, sir. And in doing that, you have to feel a certain love for actors. I personally love working with actors. It was the first thing that brought me into filmmaking. I wanted to work with actors. We were just a bit too eager that time. You had tremendous energy. I didn't even get to Yeah, I was terrified. <laughs> the adults were fantastic. They uh, exhibited great patience, great support, um, um, and obviously great talent. Uh, there was a lot of playing around. And I think it was Dan Rupert. They reprogrammed uh, Robbie Coltrane's mobile telephone uh, into Turkish, uh, which caused a little bit of a uh, dismay on Robbie's part. One of the most exciting things about these films would be to see these, the same cast throughout the seven films and to see them grow throughout their years at Hogwarts. Uh, that, that may be a pipe dream, that may not be possible, but it would be, from a cinematic point of view, very exciting. You would see, you would actually see Harry Potter grow from an 11-year-old to a 17-year-old. Excellent work, guys. Good work. Great. We're going to do it one more time. <laughs> Perfect, but we got to go again. Inevitably, when you make a film, there are things you'd like to do over. Um, and and, and work and, and, and when you see a film you go, oh, I wish I could have done that again. And one of the things that you, uh, advantages you have when you make a, a second film in, in the same world is you get to work on some of those things. Well, we learned so much. In, in the pro first in the process of making the film, we learned uh, so much about different elements of the book, the characters, Quidditch, that we take what we've learned from the first film, apply it to the second film, take the things we didn't like from the first film and change it. Um, Quidditch is pretty close to how I dreamed it. Uh, what we've got in the second film is, is we, we've we've honed uh, we've honed it a little bit. Uh, it'll be, <clears throat> I think the the movement will be a little faster. We're also incorporating a trench around the outside of the field, uh, which will be where a big portion of uh, the action takes place as Harry uh, is chased by a bludger uh, through the uh, throughout the field. In uh, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, we have many new characters, uh, amongst them Gilderoy Lockhart, uh, wonderfully narcissistic and uh, self-promoting uh, new professor of the dark arts, being played by Kenneth Branagh. And we meet uh, Ron's father, Arthur Weasley. Lucius Malfoy, who was Malfoy's father, who was wonderfully evil. We get to meet a new student, uh, a kid by the name of Colin Creevy, who's an obsessive uh, fan of Harry Potter, who's constantly taking his photographs. The, another character we meet is Ginny Weasley, who's Ron Weasley's younger sister. There's also a uh, little character sprinkled in and about. We get to see, uh, meet uh, Madame Pomfrey, who runs the, uh, the hospital for the first time. We, we, we meet Madame Sprout, who runs the greenhouse. The other thing that we have in the second film, which I really love, is the flying car. Um, which uh, um, Harry and Ron uh, fly a Ford Anglia to Hogwarts, which is a cause of much havoc and the mayhem and a lot of fun. We also meet the Whomping Willow, which uh, is a tree that w is a willow that whomps. Some new interesting characters and, and the same 
gang of uh, characters coming back. Harry, at a certain point in the second book and second film, um, is a suspect in uh, the uh, horrors that are going on at the school, and in so being, is uh, is cast aside and is is looked on with uh, both fear and, and and dislike by many of the students. And you're telling a story that's a, that's a little bit darker than the first one, and it's a, and the characters are a year older, so they're a little more complex, and little things are happening with each character. A host of uh, really wonderful, eccentric, mad, original characters that Joe has concocted that will be seen in the film. Thought you were leaving without saying goodbye, did you? I think I'm most proud of the fact that the fans of the book and the, uh, just seem to love this film. And uh, that's important. That's important to me. It's been a few years filled with the most amazing experiences, the most amazing moments. It's been a great journey. I'm very lucky.